Um, well, welcome. Thanks for coming and you're, you know, learning what it's like with alpha-gal and learning a little more about different tick-borne conditions. Um, so my name is Beth Carrison. I actually was, uh, grew up in Chelmsford. I moved away for a number of years to Kansas and then Kentucky. And um, uh, you'll hear a little bit more of my story, but I moved back here to Chelmsford uh, about 10 years ago and um, have been diagnosed with alpha-gal for, um, I'm not even really sure I should know this as I give speeches, I say this every time I do the speech. Um, it's been about nine years, I think now, total. Um, and I subsequently was diagnosed with Lyme disease after that. And in both times, if anybody in here, and I'm gonna ask a couple questions in a minute, uh, so I know what your experience is with tick-borne conditions and alpha-gal and things like that, why you're here. Um, but the story I hear more often uh, throughout all the different presentations that I do is that you know, there's just not a lot of information out there and, um, and a lot of misinformation. And um, I, like many, many others, it took many years to get diagnosed. I self-diagnosed, then I went to my doctor, had to go outside of my own healthcare practitioner, out, pay out of pocket to get tested on both conditions, and both conditions were, you know, uh, medically diagnosed as positive. So um, through that experience and getting involved in some support groups and learning everybody's story and that there were some different opportunities to change some of that, um, I just, it was like a lightning bolt hit really hard about a year ago and I just said enough. Somebody's got to say something and I know there's a lot of ad advocates out there and activists making a really great difference in you know, um, Lyme disease, but the lesser known conditions, there's not a lot of representation out there. So I felt very empowered. I got involved um, with a woman named Jennifer Platt. She holds her doctorate in public health and resides in North Carolina. And she founded her own business. Um, it's called Tick Warriors. It's an eco-friendly, uh, all natural, repellent company for people, pets, and property. And um, active ingredient is on the CDC list, so it's not like you know she's cooking it up in her kitchen or anything like that. Um, and so together we co-founded TBC United, which stands for Tick-Borne Conditions United. And our mission is um, educating healthcare practitioners, organizations, and the general public in settings like this, and at um, you know state arenas and federal federal sized arenas so I you are my last talk after three months of go 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 my son is here and can attest that I really haven't been home in three months so <laughs> um, so anyhow uh, so I'll go ahead and get started but I first I kind of want to know a little bit about you and what brought you here today so if you don't mind sharing and maybe what like a question that you have do you want to kick off well. <clears throat> I had Lyme disease for several weeks, about 10 years ago. But I know there are a lot of people who suffered a lot more than I did mm -hmm. because mine was cleared up right away with antibiotics. And I know there are other conditions from ticks, so I was interested to hear more about it. Good, okay, thanks, appreciate that. How about you? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm outside a lot. I have a big garden, and um, I'm, you know, from what I hear about all the uh, things that can happen to you with Lyme disease, I you know, almost don't want to go outside anymore. Yeah. And there are a lot of deer running around, and I don't think the the deer problem has been addressed at all. Right. And I'd like yeah. to, to see the town and the state do something about that yeah. problem. Yeah, it's uh, that's a good viewpoint there. Um, so there's been a lot of studies showing that with the increase of deers, there's the increase of ticks, the decrease of deers, the decrease of ticks. It's the, one of the main feeding uh, hosts of the ticks. So, And it depends. Different ticks feed at different times. Um, the Lone Star tick, which is predominantly known with this condition, feeds at all stages. So it's a vicious little thing. Um, Tom, Carol, what brings you here? <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, we met, Kent, we met uh, Beth at the uh, jab and was in the app. She just, uh, just connected with her cause. So. Yeah. We'd never heard of Alpha Gal before. She had conditions. 
So we should start in this planning. Yeah. Yeah. So, how about you? Uh, I had line maybe four or five years ago. Time go back to I know. <laughs> and also, Bell's Pause kind mm. of along with it. It does, yeah. I got up after getting diagnosed with Lyme and thought I was having a stroke. <laughs> it's scary. Yeah. Yeah, my nephew is the same thing. Yep. Uh, I recovered pretty well. Oh, that's my great. Yeah. Yeah, and the, so there's um, a couple reasons they're figuring out about that. So just in the last conference, we heard that they've uncovered there's a life cycle to the spire heats with Lyme disease, and it's about a four-week cycle. So has anybody ever had a flea infestation at their house? Like, no? Really? Okay, we had a lot of cats growing up, so we had a problem at one point. <laughs> And so there's a life cycle, right? So the flea has a baby, and then it has, you know, has lots of babies. It has lots of eggs, and then, you know, you spray your house, and that takes care of those fleas, the adult fleas. But the eggs are kind of protected, and then all of a sudden, um, or you know, as it's pregnant, and then all of a sudden those things hatch, and then they have babies, and it's just this vicious cycle. If you ever do the math on it, it's incredible. And it's the same thing with spirochetes, and the same thing with ticks, actually. But with the spirochetes. Um, in, in its life cycle process, it um, closes down and like encapsulates and it just protects itself. So when you're taking antibiotics during that time, it's not effective, they found. So the, so the other thing they found is, um, anybody here can attest probably that, you probably got tested for one condition, not multiple conditions. And so what they found is, People that seem to get better with Lyme in the treatment, it's because they just had Lyme. But then it's very common to have co-infections. So if, you know, it's kind of like I get in an accident, I have a broken leg and a broken arm. My doctor's just fixing my leg. I still have the broken arm, right? It's never, you know, it's not going to heal quite right unless they address it. So um, they're finding that's really important that they address both conditions or you know look for multiple conditions known to that tick. So a lot of education needing to be done. How about you? Anybody else over here? You guys? No? <laughs> My son will love hearing this. Uh, My name's Dan. I was diagnosed with alpha gal two years ago, and um, it's been a bumpy, bumpy ride for me mm. with everything, adjusting dietary stuff, yep. cross-contamination at restaurants, and it's mainly been consuming food that's been taking me out, literally. Yeah. I think I've got it dialed in now, pretty much eat vegan, um, but like little things like gelatin, which is derived from, you know, cow bones and whatever. Yeah. I'm allergic to cows 100%, so it's, it's crazy. Is that, of all the mammal meats, is that the uh, kryptonite? Yes, so I eat yeah. anything that, you know, swims or flies, yep. and it keeps me safe. Yep. Um, I just went to the allergist about six months ago, and I picked up another allergy to Lamb, another mammal. Okay, yep. From the Lone Star tick. Yep. Where were you bitten? On my leg. I still have the scars. Um, and was it here in Massachusetts? Yeah, in Cable, Massachusetts. Really? I ran out land in my backyard making an ATV trail for me and my, my sons. And um, I had it, it was like gorged in me. I just pulled it out <coughs> and continued to eat cheeseburgers and stuff and get sick for weeks on end. And yep. Didn't know what was wrong. It was just tired all the time, falling asleep. I'd just get home from work, sit on the couch, and pass out. It'd be like five o'clock. Yeah. My wife's like, what's, what's wrong? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's scary. So, you know, that went on for a long time, and no one really knew. It thought I was tired all the time. Yeah. Going to the ER and you know, dehydrated and here, drink this. And yep. None of it worked. Yeah. And then the last stop was the allergist, and they did all kinds of tests. It was 100% across the board. So you're really lucky that the allergists knew about it because most, most there's no, so one of the t hurdles, and you'll, I'll say it again, um, there's no diagnostic code. So when I walk into the ER and I say, they say, well, you know, what's your medical ailments? I'm like, I have a penicillin allergy and I have an um, alpha-gal syndrome. And they're like, is that a feminist movement? <laughs> Off Facebook, you know? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's an allergy to mammal. Mammal? 
you know, because it's not one of the top eight allergens. And do you ever categorize, like, what are you having for dinner tonight? Um, we're having mammal. You know, who says that? Who talks like that? Nobody talks like that. So, um, and then you say that it's caused from a tick bite. You are instantly discredited right then and there because it sounds insane, and it is insane. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, that's one of the things that we're working on. And um, yesterday, we got news. Uh, Tom, I haven't even told you. So this is hot off the press. Um, we got invited to go uh, participate in an FDA meeting about labeling and really finding where that's infiltrated into everywhere from food and drug. So very exciting. Um, I'm thrilled because I'm tired. I want this, you know, I want to go enjoy life again. I mean, as much as I like helping people, this would be nice to move on from this. Um, so uh, alpha-gal allergy is also alpha-gal syndrome, mammalian meat allergy, MMA. It's known by several different names. And um, until about two years ago, it really wasn't too much in the news. Uh, but it is really ramping up in the news and all over the place from um, food allergy associations to magazines to you know support groups and, and things of that nature, which is great, and tick-borne condition type groups. A lot of that has to do with uh, people in the alpha-gal support group just writing in and um, adding their two cents on something. So if somebody says something about a peanut allergy and how difficult it is, we like chime in because we're just trying to get the information out there and it's working. So um, all of these reports here, uh, I know all the people that were involved in that because we all work really hard. Um, so how many saw the Lil Sun article? Did you? Yeah, that was really good. She did a good job on that. There's one mistype on, uh, on the date, but um, let's see if this works. So for those of you that didn't. Hi, my name is Beth Carrison, and um, I was diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome, also known as the mammalian meat allergy. It's also pervasive in products like hair care, soaps, and pharmaceuticals. I was also diagnosed with Lyme disease, and uh, these two ticks right here, the black-legged tick or deer tick, it's known most uh, commonly up here in the Northeast, and the Lone Star tick. This one gave me Lyme, this one gave me alpha-gal syndrome. Both have been noted now with alpha-gal within their uh, saliva. And, um, you know, we know that there have been over 350,000 cases a year annually being diagnosed in Lyme disease alone. That doesn't include any of the other conditions. In Lyme disease, 350,000 cases, that's eight times more than HIV and AIDS, and it receives less funding than leprosy. And I'm Dr. Jennifer Platt. Ironically, while I was working on my doctorate in public health, I got ehrlichiosis from this one. So it was absolutely debilitating and life-changing for me and really made me realize what a significant impact ticks can cause. So Beth and I together have started Tick-Borne Conditions United, a new nonprofit in town. And our mission is to educate healthcare professionals, patients, and the general public about lesser known conditions such as ehrlichiosis and alpha-gal syndrome because there's a lot of attention paid to Lyme and many people are suffering from Lyme disease mm -hmm. as well as the lesser known conditions. There are many patients suffering from those too and we want to help educate about how people can live with them and manage them so that they can have a, a healthy life. All right, so for those of you that don't know what alpha-gal is, um, from a tick bite, you can become allergic to mammal meat, or specifically a carbohydrate, it's a two-part carbohydrate, called galactose alpha-1,3 galactose, and that's why they shorten it down to the word alpha-gal. And um, it's terrible for you poor men. <laughs> I really wish they would change it, it's an awful name. Even for us, it's just awful. 
Um, but that carbohydrate is found in all mammals. And so when we go out to a restaurant and we say that, you can usually tell, you look at the waitress or waiter and they start going back to third grade science and they're like, what's a mammal? You know, and they go, and I go, well, it's easier to say what I can have, fish and poultry. And they're like, wait, what? I said, fins and feathers. It's catchy, they remember it. I like that you said that. So um, humans and old world apes do not have this carbohydrate in their bodies. Um, and poultry and fish don't have it in their bodies. Bizarrely, one of the things that is similar to this is carrageenan, which I don't know if you've been tripped up by this, but carrageenan is a red algae. And the way it's processed, its structure, um, is identified in your body as pork, which is my kryptonite. Um, of all the mammal meats, it just, it's the worst for me. So um, it's the first known carbohydrate allergy and it's the first like direct cause, like something causing it. And they still don't understand exactly what is causing it and what that mechanism is. There's a lot of science changing every day on that. And uh, it is the first allergy that has this severe delay. So a two to 10 hour delay. Um, you know, what I ate this morning might be hitting me now. Like how do you, you know, the, it makes it difficult when you're having an anaphylactic reaction and you show up in the ER. The, you know, the ER is thinking, what did you just have within the last five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, you know, what have you been exposed to? So this is, these are some of the things that are tripping up. A lot of people that get diagnosed, coincidentally get diagnosed, um, the pattern is they've had anaphylaxis in the middle of the night, they're waking up, covered in hives, swelling, can't breathe, rapid heartbeat, and you know, so they're in their computer Googling, you know, kind of the symptoms and the waking up with anaphylaxis is popping this allergy up. And uh, it's because most, you know, mostly we eat our biggest meal at the end of the day. And um, what's tricky too about the allergy is we all, we say to the new people with it, um, we react differently to the different mammalian meats and we react differently at different times. Food allergies don't have any muscle memory. so. One time it could be just really severe GI distress, meaning diarrhea, just it's worse than anything you could possibly imagine. Um, it could be burning skin, like somebody has a hot iron on you, but all over your body, really itchy, your skin's crawling, it's um, hives, swelling of the face, the airway, you can't breathe, rapid heartbeat, sudden blood pressure drop, collapse, all, the, everything that goes along with a food allergy. So that can happen whether you ingest it or some people are really hypersensitive and so for some, like us, it's airborne. So if you put a pork sandwich in front of me that's hot and steamy, um, I will react. Like I'll, all of a sudden my skin will just, anywhere there's exposed skin, it'll just burn and then I'll be covered in hives. And if I don't quickly leave the area and wash up, it could blossom into anaphylaxis, I never know. Um, and there's some other things that set it off airborne like and so then also you think of like topical so stuff that I apply on my skin or um, you know if I touch meat like I don't we don't cook it in our house anymore we don't even have it in our house anymore um, or anything yeah. Does the epi pen reverse that if you have one with you? So that's a good question um, no not really so, I mean, yeah, it does, it calms your histamines down, but EpiPens, Benadryl, antihistamines are absolutely no good guarantee um, that you survive an anaphylactic reaction. Not to sound, but it, it's true. So there's a lot of people that say, oh, I'll just gamble it and I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna have pizza. Uh, some people can't have dairy, so, um, because there is alpha-gal in there, some people just seem to tolerate it a little bit better, but, uh, you know, it's Russian roulette, you never know. Or they say, I haven't had a steak in months, I'm gonna have a steak, and they have a steak and they risk it. So they kind of treat themselves with some Benadryl and they have their EpiPen. And there's no guarantee that you're gonna survive an anaphylactic reaction ever, even with two shots or three shots. We have people who have carry four shots of epinephrine and that just gets them to where the ambulance gets to their door. And it's still, you know, they're still touch and go. Um, there's only one lab in the, 
that tests for this too, which is odd, and they're working on that. There's a couple places working through that right now. So um, I have some brochures up there that have the, that has the information on it. Um, and let's see, anything else I want to say? No, it's carbohydrate allergy, delayed reaction. It can be airborne mammal. And mammal, think of um, warm, warm-blooded live birth vertebrate has fur. So not fins, not feathers. So you wonder, okay, I don't want to get bitten by this tick because I like my cheeseburgers, right? So something to know, worldwide, there's six known ticks. Um, I have their common name and their scientific name, except for number six, there is no common name for it. So um, he, worldwide, there's six different ticks. In the United States, we know there's three of these ticks here. One of them has been documented from the tick bite to the human causing a reaction. They're not sure what that connection is exactly. So that's very loosely said. It is said, it is documented, but it's, you know, the science is changing on that. Um, the black-legged tick or the deer tick is um, the tick we all know up here in New England, and that causes Lyme disease and some other conditions. Um, and my business, this is the back of my business card, which is over there. So you can, you know, have the back of the card. It shows the three biting ticks in this region of the country. But the black-legged tick, they recently found, uh, well, last year I testified in front of a federal advisory committee called the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. And if anybody here has Lyme or any other condition or a loved one, I strongly encourage you to go to Google Tick-Borne Disease Working Group and they have uh, public open commentary sessions where you can write in or call in, and that's how I got involved and more involved. I, so they have another meeting coming up, I think it's June 3rd, but um, we spoke out on that and we said, you know, there's a really strong undercurrent of people with Lyme disease that are, I mean, there's thousands of commentaries in the support groups online and they're saying, I don't know what's going on. I can't eat red meat anymore. Anybody else, right? Or gosh, you know, I'm really struggling. Nothing's setting right in my stomach. And so all the alpha gal support people, we're kind of trying to help support. And we're saying, you, you should probably go get tested for alpha gal just to make sure you don't have this because it could be so dangerous, right? And a bunch of people are coming back and they have alpha gal in addition. So I said, you know, when I testified to the Federal Advisory Committee, I said it would be really great if you did some testing in that and check that out. So um, Dr. Scott Cummins and a uh, whole crew, they did just that this past year, and they found that the black-legged tick was, uh, had alpha-gal in its saliva. But what they also found and didn't expect was they've thought that the tick bites the, um, now the Lone Star Tick bites at the three different stages, uh, nymph, um, a, a larva, nymph, and adult. And they thought that the tick was biting its host, which is predominantly a ma mammal, right? A uh, mouse or a deer or a turkey, which is odd, but um, mouse or deer and they were thinking that it was picking it up and then when it bit you, it was causing this reaction. And in my mind, that never made sense because I'm eating the meat. You know, like why am I not allergic to the meat? It, you know what I mean? It didn't make sense. So what they found here just recently is um, the ticks had the alpha-gal in their saliva system before their first blood meal. So they don't understand what's going on with that, but um, it's important to know. The third tick that's here in the country that has not been documented, uh, but here in the country, but has been documented in other parts of the world is capable of having this is the Asian longhorn tick. How many have heard of this tick? All right, so the Asian longhorn tick is um, concerning uh, the science scientists because it's asexual, which means that it self reproduces, doesn't need a mate and um, it's pretty aggressive. And it's hard to identify, it looks like some of the other ticks, so they're finding it in all over now, um, but they, they're they thinking it was here for quite a while now, they just weren't picking up on it. So uh, that's one to watch, it's got a lot of 
nasty little diseases that it comes with, but alpha-gal is one of them. So now the next question I always get is, well, where in the world is alpha-gal? So you can Google exactly this phrase, where in the world is alpha-gal, and you'll find this patient-driven, it's like citizen science, science map. It's a little bit um, inaccurate in the sense that patients have been tagging themselves where they live, not where they're bitten, or some are tagging vice versa, or some are tagging both places. So, but now the next question is, well, Beth, is it, where is it in my part of the world? So this map right here, um, the, if you go to that where in the world is alpha-gal syndrome, you can zoom in and open up the, the map. So you can see up the East Coast, so when I was first diagnosed, I was the only person on that map from New York up. And some of those dots are multiple people. They're not singular. And not everybody knows about this. There's a lot of people that don't know about the support group, a lot of people who don't use Facebook, a lot of people don't use Twitter. You know, like I said, and the doctors don't, you don't go home with a pamphlet. You go home with, just don't eat red meat. Um, so this is pretty disturbing, but it's all the way up into Canada now as well. You were living here, you got it? Um, so I was bitten in Kansas, yeah. So coincidentally, which I, I thought was kind of odd too, is I was bitten in Kansas year back in the 90s. Nobody could figure out what was going on. Um, I connected the dots in a really strange set of ways, and whenever I realized I saw this tick pop up, I was like, oh, I was bitten by that tick. And I thought, a sick tick, because the female has a white spot on her back, the Lone Star. And I thought sick tick, because my mom always said, our little fish in the fishbowl, and it had the white spot, they were sick with ick, and they were gonna die. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna die. I was, I was okay, but I had these random hives, couldn't really figure out what was going on. It wasn't really that bad. I mean, it was bad, but it wasn't like it is now. And then um, right in the same time frame, I was in a car accident, which is they're finding is a triggering moment for a lot of the relapsing of Lyme disease and the different conditions because, like I said, those germs kind of like encapsulate and then they spring back open. So they think like traumatic events do that, uh, whether it's emotional, emotional or physical. So they were thinking maybe that might be it, but I also was bitten by the black-legged tick at that time. And that's when the whole allergy just like exploded on me. I was really having a hard time with everything around me. And um, I got serious trying to figure it out. And when I made that connection, I, frankly, I was in denial. I was like, no, this can't be happening. And so I refrained from all mammal meat and I tried some pork and I really struggled. I had my lips swelled up, I couldn't breathe, my eyes swelled up and I was covered in hives and I said, oh, I should probably go get this checked out. And I was fortunate, Dr. Curtis Moody in Concord actually um, just came home from a conference where the founding doctor was speaking and he said, geez, you, you got lucky. He said, I, I actually, I think this might be what you have. So when he tested me, he tested me for the protein allergy and um, the carbohydrate allergy, so blood test and then a skin prick test. Two and a half hours later, the skin prick test, because of that, that caused me to have a big reaction. So um, definitely, you know, eye-opening to both of us. So we just kind of rode the wave and figured it out as we went, you know, didn't go crazy at first. I kept dairy in my diet. He checked on me a week later. I was still reacting every time I had dairy, so we took that out. And what I found, I don't know about you, but I found that dairy, I can have some dairy, um, usually low fat dairy is better because it doesn't have as much alpha-gal. The alpha-gal is heavy in fattier meats. Um, but if it, a lot of dairy has that carrageenan in it, which again is a red algae, but the way it's processed, your body identifies it as pork, that or animal rennet sets me off. I mean, I might as well eat bacon. So as long as dairy doesn't have those two things in it, I'm pretty good, except Parmesan cheese. For some reason, Parmesan cheese kind of bothers me. So here are some of the symptoms of um, uh, allergic reactions. This came from the FAIR website. So you can see it's really hard to diagnose, you know, when you, you don't know, because like you were saying, or, you know, somebody says, 
was it like that for everything? I'm like, well, no, because when I was first diagnosed and I made the connection, I thought, no, this can't be what I have because I'm okay with beef. I'm okay with beef, and I don't eat lamb, so I don't know. And I was like, no, I'm okay with beef. And then I realized as I'm reading through these different symptoms, like itchy mouth or ear canal, that, that's a problem for me. And tinnitus, I have tinnitus, terrible um, if I've had dairy, so I know it's sort of bothering me. Um, and then these severe symptoms, right? You can have these, but I didn't realize like the range in symptoms. So I knew when I had pork, I was in trouble. When I had beef, I was just uncomfortable. It's like if you look at chili and you go like, hmm, I love chili, but I know that's gonna you know, hurt after, I'm gonna have acid reflux. It's, it's different, you know? So um, I realized then that, geez, I actually do have that problem. And so, um, and if anybody, this, I put this in red, the sense of impending doom. So my son here in the front corner uh, has a peanut allergy and he hasn't had a reaction in a long, long time. But when he was little, um, he had a couple bad reactions. And so y you can definitely see that look in your eye that something's drastically wrong. Uh, my ex-husband has had anaphylaxis multiple times and uh, my stepson had as well. So I got to see it from their point of view, but until you've experienced it, you don't quite understand what that means. You know you are in absolute trouble when that happens and um, it's kind of scary. So. so this right here is this lovely picture of me and that one there was um, when somebody had pork in front of me and I in five minutes in front of me it was hot steamy if it's if it's cold ham I'm okay because it's not steaming up in the air and you know the particles aren't hitting me but that was so that side of my face I was sitting like this the pork sandwich was here and it just I felt it I just felt my skin burning and then all of a sudden I was covered in hives it moved over you know it spread throughout my body the reaction um, the same thing ironically happens to me um, with perfumes and colognes. I don't know if your experience is like that, but if it has a mammal carrier in it, that sets me off. So unfortunately, uh, I had a bad reaction at a funeral in Wake. Um, a friend of mine passed away and you know we're all hugging and by the time I got up to say my condolences to the uh, widow, I was covered and I had to leave right away. So. Um, all my conferences that I speak at, they always put it, you know, and I'm not the only one. A lot of people have chemical sensitivities because of the different tick-borne conditions. And um, they have uh, no fragrance policy, but people don't quite understand fully and they come in with perfumes and colognes. And unfortunately, every single conference that I've gone to speak at, I've had a reaction, every single one. Um, so it's a little frustrating, but as I speak out on it, I can guarantee you those people aren't wearing perfume <laughs> the next time they go to that conference. So, because um, I get really nice apologies, you know, people don't realize, you know, they think it's a sniffle or just a preference, and it's not, it's anaphylaxis. So now, how many people get this? Uh, right now in the United States, they've, this one lab has reported over 60,000 people with it. Um, in the last 10 years. They think that is severely understated because that a lot of people just don't know. Um, the last two years, there's about, been about 16,000 and that's coming out of the same area of the country because it's gaining momentum and doctors are more aware of it. All right, so a day in the life of somebody with alpha-gal. So I'm gonna do this little um, scenario with you that I've done, it's been kind of fun. So everybody stand up. All right, thank you. I know who's gonna win. <laughs> it's not a contest. Okay, so this morning, if you took a shower and you used just, you know, your everyday soap that you get at the grocery store, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, um, if you've used one of those really nice razors with that glide gel strip that doesn't cut your legs anymore, I love that. If you've used any of those products, sit down. Okay. 
If you use deodorant, cologne, perfume, lotions, cosmetics, or cosmetic brushes that were not synthetic, sit down, please. If you took any supplements, prescription, uh, over-the-counter, pill form, capsule form, specifically gelatin capsule, um, or uh, if you have a need for heparin, I don't know that anybody would use that just casually, but um, uh, yeah, so any medications, any supplements, um, and you know that they weren't made at a compounding pharmacy and they did not contain any mammal derived ingredients like magnesium stearate, which nobody would really think that's cow, right? Sit down, please. What about aspirin? Aspirin, it's over the counter, yep. So that would be something, yep. Yep, you can sit down, yep. So, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, if you have taken a plane, a train, or an automobile, uh, like a shared lift ride or something like that, um, you've been in any public settings, meaning like at work, at a school, a hospital, then you would sit down. Yeah? Okay. So we're here tonight, but that's okay. What's that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. And then the last question, you might get this one. Um, if you have kissed your spouse and your spouse did not brush and floss their teeth on the same day that they've eaten any mammal meats, you can sit down. Oh, okay, either she brushes and flosses or. <laughs> oh, that's good, yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yay, good, yeah. Oh, that's great. So the, you can sit down now. Thank you. So um, he has alpha gal syndrome, if you didn't catch that. So this is the first time we met. We met on one of the support groups here just a couple of weeks ago, actually, your wife and I. And uh, so it was really funny. So I've been doing this little, um, you know, stunt, if you will, <laughs> at the different conferences. And it was really interesting to see, like, uh, the Augusta Civic Center stand up and just the wave of people sitting down at each of those questions. And the couple of people that stood were either diagnosed with alpha-gal, because they knew exactly the questions, what was happening. They, they didn't know I was asking a question, but they knew they, knew they were safe with where I was going at. Um, or they were vegans and um, they took their own car <laughs> to the event. So that was kind of interesting. So um, in those products, there's often mammal. So it makes our life really difficult to navigate. Um, every morning, day, night, our relationships, um, whether they're our spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, our children, because the children come in with their friends, they're wearing cologne, um, uh, holidays, special occasions, those are difficult to navigate because Aunt Sally loves to make her cheesy, you know, whatever dish, and your mom or stepmom likes to make the prime rib or the ham at Easter, and you are absolutely upsetting their household. Some, it's cultural driven, and it's really, really difficult, you know? It, make, it makes it tough because then all of a sudden you're the one that's not invited because they want to keep the tradition. Respectful, I get that. Um, but it, it's, it hurts, so there's a psychological impact to the family, especially for kids that have this, because the kids um, in the school setting, they can't, they can't just go sit at the peanut table. You know, his allergy wasn't airborne, but he, you know, he at least could sit at the peanut table and you know, we'd bring in pizza and that was great. These kids can't even be in, some of them that are highly sensitive, they can't even be in the wing of the school we have several, many kids that have had to be pulled out of the school setting and homeschooled because they can't, you know, with all the colognes at the high school and, you know, beef burgers cooking and dairy covered pizza and just general exposure. So um, definitely, and then of course dating and all the social affairs that go with school, it makes it really tough for them. Medical dental visits, that's another form of relationship um, and uh, everyday struggle for us because you don't run into the same people in the ER usually um, and you have to go through the same Abbott and Costello routine every time, you know, 
know, it's not a feminist movement. No, it's not a vegan movement. It's, you know, life-threatening food allergy. And you're lucky if you can actually speak during that episode. So um, I actually carry this everywhere I go. This is my Bible. It's an alpha gal emergency binder is what I call it. And um, I have this in my back window of my car usually or somewhere in my car so that if I'm in an accident, somebody will see that, I hope. Uh, but in here, I have like that letter from my doctor, my allergist going to my doctor. I have, you know, medical, my medical statements, emergency plans. I have specific things for the doctor so that they can see it and understand it. Um, you know, like that it's in medications. It could be in the IV bag. There could be gelatin filler. The sticky pads they put on you for heart monitor and everything. Um, remember the old saying, they take the horse to the glue factory? Horses are mammals, right? So a lot of the supplies like that come from China and that we found big lots of that and that has um, mammal in it, a lot of the adhesives. So that'll set me off, but not, for some reason that doesn't seem to trip my trigger quite as bad like a full anaphylaxis, but it definitely adds to my histamine bucket, so. Uh, question. Yeah. China got one-fifth one of the world population, why? In your map showed earlier there was absolutely no pieces of this disease. Is there a, is there a, I know we have, I'm not originally come from China, I know we have ticks, but why Chinese? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't know, so that's a good question. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I, I think I have an answer to it, I'm not sure though. Um, so that's a patient-driven map. And we noticed down in South America, there weren't any uh, down there either. And um, we thought maybe there's a language barrier, right? And we got contacted two months ago, I got contacted two months ago from a researcher in Argentina and said, I found you. <laughs> you know, we're having a problem down here. Can you connect me? I've been trying to reach out to the researchers. I've seen everything you've been doing. Can you make a connection? So we connected them to the Australian um, doctor who founded AlphaGal, Dr. Cheryl Van Noonan. She spoke for us last year for this big long hour, it was a little over an hour, um, uh, AlphaGal specific symposium that we held. You can find that on YouTube or on my tbcunited.org. And um, a couple other doctors, Dr. Tina Merritt, who is, uh, she was on the US research team. She's also the chairwoman of our uh, nonprofit. And so we connected the Argentinian research team with the US team and the Australian team. We have worked with a lot of countries. Um, we work a lot with uh, Africa. We actually helped a woman who was Googling from South Africa, she had no idea what was going on and she was Googling her symptoms and it came up, she thought she had this connection, so she joined our support group, we talked with her, we helped her, she'd never left her village. She, we helped her get over to the United States um, and she just got carried couch to couch by the support group and ultimately saw Dr. Scott Cummins, was, he was the third person on the US team and got diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome, went back, and now she's a big advocate for her country and leading the way there and working with the uh, hospitals there, so that's great. But so 24-7, 365, everything that goes in, on, and around us, we have to be vigilant about. There's never a break. Um, and I'm gonna show you another little video. This was shown down in Virginia. We've got another conference coming up um, August 24th. If you want to take a road trip, it's really good. A lot of people. Are this is. wall and insulation.
So that, that's, I don't know if you picked up exactly what that is, but all of those products, that's all <coughs> stuff that we have to think about. So I've had, I used to work with um, architects and uh, a company that sold furniture and equipment and you know, it helped libraries and schools outfit their buildings with um, furniture. And um, one of the schools caught fire right before the furniture landed, so they quick, you know, tore down all the plaster, put it back up, the drywall, sanded it, painted it, and everything. And I was covered in hives every time I had to set foot in that building. It was awful. So I would go with like my scarf. I did everything I could because it was a big project. I couldn't really hand it off. And I, um, I couldn't figure out what was setting me off, but somebody in the Alpha Gal team suggested it was maybe the drywall and the paint because that's in a lot of drywall and paint. So we found out what drywall, what paint, and sure enough, that is exactly what was setting me off. So who knew? Um, but everything from tires to, um, you know, the medications, crayons, the crayons that have tallow in it. Um, it's just, now it's kind of listed out to have a kind of an idea. Yeah? Yeah, how do you, how do you know that that tape is the only thing that causes the cigarette? They don't know that. Um, they have connected it to some other insects worldwide, um, but they don't really know. There just hasn't been a lot of research to it, so that's why we're really advocating a lot. Like we're getting, you know, I go down to Washington, we speak at the Federal Advisory Committee. So that federal, federal Advisory Committee, they were appointed by Congress under the 21st Century Cures Act to review uh, all the gaps and overlaps going on in the country on tick-borne disease research. Alpha-gal is an allergy, it's not a disease. So like Lyme, you have something that's living in you now. Alpha-gal is now a response to something. They haven't uncovered if it's like a vector-borne disease. So it wasn't included in the research ever. Um, but you know, as I testified December, well, I wrote in December 2017 um, and spoke before the committee I, exactly three minutes. Let me tell you, it's a power pack speech. You can get the speeches too from everybody and uh, everybody's written commentary that writes in from the public on the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group webpage. Um, but, you know, we said, you know, you gotta put some money at this. And you, if you've ever tried to put together a puzzle, you, if you have one piece missing, you can't put the puzzle together. You need all the pieces and there's multiple pieces of the puzzle missing. There's all kinds of um, conditions that just aren't included in the research because it doesn't fit the definition of the way they do the research, the way it's funded, which makes sense, you know? It's kind of like trying to ask McDonald's to serve you calamari. They don't do it, it's not the way they operate. So, mm -hmm. I've had instances with a lot of things up there. Would you elaborate a little bit on baked potatoes? Oh, yes. Um, yep. So some baked potatoes, like at the Outback and a couple other restaurants, they brush it with pork fat. That's why they're so tasty. Yeah, <coughs> hidden, <coughs> hidden places. Um, I think is natural flavorings up there. That's one that trips up a lot. Um, oh, yep, okay, so natural flavoring sounds harmless, right? Mm -hmm. Insulin, I know there's pork and beef insulin, but that's the old stuff. What about the new DNA comprised insulin? Um, I think there is an insulin that you can take, but a lot of the um, subsidized, they're finding, isn't. So another example, not insulin, but um, the woman I spoke of in South Africa, she runs an orphanage and most of the children have um, HIV AIDS and they're on these RV medications that are donated by the World Health Organization and unfortunately um, they have mammal in it and she's just terrified. She just knows it's a matter of time before those two worlds collide. So then, you know, it's a decision. Do you go without the medication or do you take the medication and some steroid antihistamine, and can a baby actually take that? Well, you know, it's, it's tough. So um, uh, we know heparin, so right now there's uh, a company called Revivacor um, that has been genetically modifying out alpha-gal out of the, some pigs, and they're 
funding is targeted for like heart valve transplants and some diabetic medications and um, lung transplants. So when you get, uh, you, you can get a synthetic heart valve transplant or you can get a pig transplant. So the folks down in the endemic areas like North Carolina, Arkansas, Virginia, that hotbed down there, some of the patients that have had that uh, procedure done that are getting bitten, they're in trouble. So they're moving this along as fast as they can. So they've been, I think they have like 10 or 12 years of um, successful now uh, pigs that don't have this alpha-gal. So more to come on that, which is really promising for us. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you get the synthetic, so they, they thought, oh, this, I think the patient's rejecting this heart valve, right? So what do they do? They whisk them off to surgery, they rip out the heart valve, <laughs> they put in a synthetic one, and they start giving him um, heparin. All the heparin has mammal in it too. So it's just a no-win situation right now. It's really kind of scary. We had somebody on dialysis recently that called us panicked on a Saturday night. The spouse was dying, they, you know, and all the blood builders had alpha-gal in it, and they were just like, but they, we figured out a protocol to help them out. I mean, I didn't, I'm not a doctor, so. Um, so anyway, yeah, a lot of these, uh, all this up here, I mean, it's in like processed foods, it's in nail polish got me once, I couldn't figure out why all, I was just nonstop reactive. And coincidentally, I was wearing this really cute teal nail polish for Allergy Awareness Month. And um, I was seeing a dietitian to kind of work on my diet a little bit, make sure like I was getting the right nutrients because you know, you get thrown off in your diet. And um, I was having this nonstop reaction and she said, something's not right. And then she said, you know, the first two times you came in, you didn't have nail polish on. She goes, how often do you do that? And I said, I'd never wear nail polish. I mean, I do now because I found cute vegan nail polish. But um, so that's, she looked up the brand and sure enough it had mammal in it. So that was kind of an interesting thing. Uh, surgical sutures, internal sutures, um, you can get them without mammal. I mean, all of the stuff you can get without mammal in different forms. Um, there's plant-based glycerin, leather, suede. Some people react, some don't. I'm okay with leather, suede, not so much. Uh, it's just too raw, it sets me off. Dairy, whey, some people react, some people don't. Adhesive bandages, tape, envelopes. I've had a bad reaction from licking an envelope, believe it or not. Yes, they can because we don't have alpha gal, we react to alpha gal. Yeah, there's been a lot of debate about that. Um, I don't because I have trouble with low blood sugar issues, I had a bad reaction, but even if I didn't, I personally wouldn't because I don't think the story's finished. I don't think they've really figured this thing out. And, and that's my personal belief. A lot of people still do. And oh, right, right, yeah. And I mean, in the end, I, you know, even when I was trying to donate blood and I was having trouble with it, I always said, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm just thinking of the person receiving the blood. They're probably doing a lot worse than me. This is bad, it is dangerous, you know, but, you know. Since we're mammals, have you found that people with alpha gal could be allergic to some people? No, we don't have alpha gal in our bodies. Um, humans and old world apes don't have it. Yep, yep. Uh, pet foods, you know, there's a lot of mammal in that. That can be a problem. Some candles, wax, asphalt binder. We had a gentleman find that out the hard way. <laughs> his job. A lot of professions had to change. Yeah. Uh, like if you get bitten by a, um, a deer tick, <clears throat> the deer tick, from what I understand, may or may not have the, the bacteria that cause Lyme disease. Yeah. Uh, if you get bitten by the slow star tick, mm -hmm. is it guaranteed that you're going to get you guys ask great questions. I love this. Um, it's so nice not like, so you're vegan? <laughs> um, the answer is no, not everybody gets it. So we have a couple that's husband and wife. They own a farm and they're repeatedly bitten. One seems to get sicker and sicker, more reactive, and the other one's fine. So they don't really understand why. Um, I know for me, the, like I said, I was in the car accident. I was bitten again by the black-legged tick. 
a couple of times. We would place up a main. We hike all the time. So I think that they do know that if you're rebitten by the tick, um, it exasperates the problem. Um, some people go into what they call remission now first. They were saying they get over it, but they really don't. As soon as you get rebitten again, it's worse. So that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of situations where people have grown out of it? Yeah, so that's the same thing. Yeah, they found that um, there's a very small population that go into remission, is what they're calling it. Yeah. My allergist told me out of, out of this one in five of people that they know that had it, three of them, no traces in general. That's excellent. Over a three year period of time, so I'm like, yeah. Okay, I'm not yeah. So I know, for me, what I did, so my, if you saw my name, Beth Carrison, and then INHC, it's Integrative Nutrition Health Coach, um, because I became this super ingredient detective <laughs> to, to self-serving, I got really interested in nutrition, so I went back to school, I went to the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and became trained as a health coach. And um, my family uh, unit, when I was married, there were five of us under the roof, four of us had over 30 food allergies combined. So it was really tricky to, I mean, you just learn a different way. We eat really clean, we don't eat a lot of processed foods, and you just learn, we have new favorites, we just, it's different. Um, but, yeah. Uh, a situation, uh, Carol was out from my deck one day, I built one floor up, and when she got home, she was to take a shower, she found she had a tick on her leg. She wasn't out in the woods or anything. Yeah, we have to find this tick. Yeah. So ticks, um, have they, part of the spread you'll see is follows a migratory pattern. So birds carry ticks. So if you're walking along, you hear people say, oh, they jumped at me. They don't jump. They, they're on the little rodents that go up in the tree or the birds, and they fall off, and then they just drop, right? Um, and going back to your question, they, some studies are finding that the deer tick transmits sooner than 24 hours, so I'm sure there's a lot of more science that'll go on that. With the Lone Star tick, it's immediate. You know, you could get it, you might not get it. Powassan virus transmits within 15 minutes, um, but the science the, that happens is really still evolving fast, really fast. When we're, Question, I'm going to keep going. Well, I'll, I'm going to leave in time for us to ask questions, but go ahead. <laughs> well, my question is, wouldn't the research be good if the husband and wife in the farm look at the wife and find out why she's not getting it? Right, right. And then that might solve a big part of the problem by looking at her, not at him. That would require funding. <laughs> so we're, we're working on that. That's something that we're doing. I mean, I'm just Beth from Chelmsford. Mom of Dana and Joe, <laughs> they got bit by a tick, you know, They're making a lot of noise. And um, it's working, but, you know, it it's, was disappointing that the experts overseeing the experts didn't really even know about AlphaGal and didn't have a good handle on it. So you think of that, um, we've got a long way to go. It shouldn't be this hard, but it is. But the, now uh, there's, there was a lot changed last year when we did that um, presentation and they accepted AlphaGal into the conversation. They said, we do have to expand the language in which we operate. So they wrote a 108 page report with endless recommendations to Congress and they got accepted. So a lot's changed where a year ago AlphaGal wasn't listed on the CDC website, it got listed and then it got listed again a little bit more robustly with many inaccuracies that we have written in about. So uh, hopefully that'll get changed soon. So um, one of the best inventions is the phone because I Google all the time and I'm afraid if I say it, um, but if I ask this question, hey, you who, <laughs> Uh, is such and such vegan? How is it made? Is this mammalian ingredient? Um, and then there is a website you can get a list of alcohol because believe it or not, it's even in alcohol. And they found too that alcohol and exercise um, can exasperate or induce the allergy faster than if you don't. And um, 
you know, why that is. Like if you exercise and then have a glass of wine or a beer, it goes through your blood system faster. So that, that's one reason. The other reason is it's a high histamine food because it's fermented. So that raises your, hist you know, it's fermented. So it raises your histamine. And also I think we're missing a lot of people just are grabbing a beer or the house wine and it's got mammal in it and they don't realize it. But again, not everybody's that sensitive. So, you know, and the, there's sort of like a wax and wane to it. Like right around now where the seasonal allergies are really bad or environmental exposures, your histamines are up because you're kind of fighting that off. Um, that, it, it's, I say oftentimes it's like living like a diabetic where you have to kind of balance your food and make sure you're watching how much sugar you're getting and carbs. It's the same thing, how much your histamine levels are. So like if you're um, stressed, that raises your histamines. So education and awareness for healthcare professionals. Um, we're not upset with anybody that holds any of these titles. This is brand new, really. It's only been discovered in the United States 10 years. Uh, not a lot of training in the medical schools or the dental schools on tick-borne conditions. And certainly not a lot of training in the manufacturing and development of foods <laughs> or pharmaceuticals like this, like we just explained. So. Um, coincidentally, did anybody see the post out there on the Facebook uh, pages here in town where I said, um, what do I have in common with Martha Stewart, John Gershom, Bacon Burger? No? All right. Wow. See? Facebook doesn't always work. <laughs> uh, okay, so this whole thing originated from the Martha, well, Martha Stewart has a tie-in to this whole thing. So remember how she went to jail for insider trading, selling off her stock? The stock she sold was with a company that um, was uh, involved in a cancer drug trial. It had a very promising outlook for it. It was a drug called cetuximab. And people that were taking it were having these really severe allergic reactions and one died. And they, couldn't figure out what was going on. So they thought, oh, there's something really awful with the drug trials working on the humans. So they were gonna scrap the trial. And there, at the same time, there were some coincidental conversations taking place. And what they found was, um, so remember, alpha-gal at the time hadn't been discovered. It's still not on a tracking map because there's no diagnostic code or anything. But that Lone Star Tick gives um, other conditions, Rocky Mountain spotted fever being one of them, and that is being tracked by the CDC. So coincidentally, they noticed that the map where all these people were having the allergic reactions on the cetuximab trials coincided with the Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So they overlapped it and they said, hmm, there's a coincidence. So they started asking the patients, did you get bit by a tick? And they all said yes. And so that's how they made the connection. And then they had to really dig deeper to find out like, oh, well, what's causing it? If you're bitten by the tick, what's causing it from the tick? And so they had to develop a test for alpha-gal, which was tough because it's a first carbohydrate allergy, first delayed reaction. It's really kind of an interesting story. And uh, John Gershom, the author, um, he has alpha-gal too. And so doesn't Steve Troxler, the North Carolina Agricultural Commissioner, which is one of the big pig exporters. So he's, um, I, when, one of my testimonies, I said, if you want to quantify the financial impact, call Steve. Because <laughs> I bet you he's running some numbers through his head. Um, FDA labeling, and this, this TBDWG stands for Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. So labeling, um, I said, there's no labeling for alpha-gal syndrome or alpha-gal allergy. Uh, but in 2015, there was a representative in Arkansas that uh, was diagnosed with the allergy. She used her position of power to create an alpha-gal task force and they filed a bill which became an act and they submitted a big report asking for support and labeling and it got denied. And we expected it was gonna be denied because there hasn't been studies on it. So not enough studies for them to, to make this um, labeling happen, but now we are getting some traction on that. So hopefully more to come on that this year. 
Uh, and the Alpha-Gal community, we all presented to Congress or to the committee appointed by Congress to help with all of that. And that's been really beneficial, um, helping with that. Medical and dental world is affected, like I mentioned before, uh, cetuximab, gelatin and IVs, heparin, magnesium stearate, vaccines. That's another thing that I find very troublesome. Um, whether you believe in vaccines or not, they have eradicated the, a lot of the conditions, right? The diseases worldwide. All of the vaccines that we've looked into all have mammal in them. And so that makes the endemic area kind of a hot spot for that reblooming of previously eradicated diseases. That's very scary. So last year, I cut the tip of my thumb off with some new kitchen knives accidentally and ended up in the ER and they were trying to give me a tetanus shot. And I kept saying, please look up the ingredients. And um, I have my handy dandy binder and I have that list on my, I have several of those documents on my phone. Not accessible by internet, actually saved on my phone because what I found in an emergency setting, I was kind of dead in the water because when you're in the building, you're in the steel, you can't access the internet. So I keep it printed and I keep it an actual thing on my phone and my phone's always charged for that reason. So anyway, I pull up, the, he wouldn't look at the, the ingredients. I, you know, he tried sticking me with the um, vaccination again and I said, I, I'll take it if you can guarantee me it doesn't have that in it. And if it does, and you really think I might have tet, like be, be in trouble with tetanus, we need to talk about like some steroidal treatment or something, and I need to make sure that's you know, safe for me too. And he said, what are you allergic to again? And I said, mammal, I know it sounds crazy. And he goes, ma'am, I'm not trying to feed you a cheeseburger. <laughs> I'm like, channeling the inner advocate, <laughs> you know, be nice, be nice. And it was hard. So I pulled up my list on my phone and I asked him, I said, could you verify which, which tetanus you're giving me? And he said, that one. And I said, and what do the ingredients say? And he says, oh, well, I'll be, look at that. So lesson learned, he didn't know. No. Um, so in the vaccines, I'm asked all the time, what's in the vaccine? Well, there's a lot of things. This is a short list. If you want to look it up, you can go and Google. So I sat there. So I went looking through. You can see over here um, the ingredients, right? Bovine, pig, canine, African green monkey, guinea pig cell cultures, cocker spaniels, mouse brains, calf. Those in por porcine gelatin, those all sound and then fetal bovine that those all sound mammalish right <laughs> but what about lactose well some people kind of pick up on that glycerin uh, I knew it from all the other ingredients probably derived from mammal and I found in that one it was magnesium stearate same thing usually it's mammalian derived but these other ones, Mueller's growth medium, medium 199, Fenton medium, I was like, oh, that's curious. I wonder what that's made of. So one of them, Mueller's growth medium, one of the ingredients said Mueller's growth medium without, and I think it was calf uh, serum or something like that, you know, something that said like mammal to me. And I was like, oh, okay, that one should be good. And then I thought, mm, what makes up the rest of that Mueller's growth medium so I dug in and there were layers of it that involved mammal so um, you know something that's concerning I, I've spoken with people at the CDC about that as well and it's actually something that helps the vaccine be a little bit more effective so um, kind of a trouble I mean we could potentially get it the vaccines but you know it's like your question does the EpiPen you know always save you well no, not always. So you're taking a risk when you're doing it, but sometimes it's really the risk outweighs the benefit, so you kind of have to. Uh, ongoing support. So um, 
I always tell people, you know, keep working with your practitioners so that they grow with you. Send them, every time you see a report, you send it to your doctor so they learn and grow alongside of you. Because it's really frustrating when you show up at your doctor and you know more than them and you're in trouble, you know, because they're, they're like, wait, you know, they want to make sure you're not just Googling it off of Bob's website. You know, they want to make sure it's real credible information. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't want my doctor Googling Bob's website for information, you know. Um, so these are uh, the different support systems, I guess, and the ADA laws, that's another one, it's kind of tough. So this is another example of, this is really an example of a day in the life. So this was, I was on Long Island this past weekend with Jennifer Platt, um, the other co-founder of Tick-Borne Disease, or TBC United, and uh, in all our travels, every morning, she's got the drill down pat. First off, she never packs her stuff. She uses my stuff because it just makes it safer in the shower. But um, in the morning, she gets up and she goes down to the hotel lobby and to the restaurant and gets my coffee and checks out what the menu is and if it's safe for me to go down there because if it's a small area and they're cooking bacon or sausage, I can't be in there because of the airborne incident. So most often I can't go, she'll just grab me some food, she knows the drill, she makes sure they check, cooks it separately and it's all safe and everything. So we did this little awareness piece. Public health circles, they have a term called dailies, which stands for disability adjusted life years. It's basically a measure of your quality of life. People that have tick-borne conditions that are chronic and recurring are constantly dealing with issues on their quality of life. My business partner, Beth, who has been diagnosed with alpha-gal syndrome, has to worry constantly when she's out in public about what she's gonna be exposed to. Case in point, right here behind me, is the kitchen and what kind of things that they're cooking. Maybe they're cooking pork bacon or pork sausage. That's actually her kryptonite. So before we came down to breakfast this morning, I had to come out and check it out and make sure that it was safe for her. That is what it's like to deal with a tick-borne condition in one little small scenario every single day, every single month, every single year. And she goes and she checks out my environment for me to make sure that I'm safe. And she's kind of a pit bull too when we go to the conferences and people say, oh my God, I, I saw you online, oh, and you want to hug me? And she's like, wait, do you have anything on? And they're like, oh yeah, sorry about that. You know, because we float around in different like Lyme disease circles and stuff like that. Uh, so the other area is education to different organizations like schools, employers, food service, manufacturers. We've talked to a lot of different manufacturers. We've got a couple that started labeling their stuff alpha-gal safe because they saw a great market for it, which is good. Um, outdoor clubs, hunting, fishing, athletic, gardening, off-roading, all of those we go around and we talk to and, you know, so if you have any of those, we'd love to come in and talk to them about it. Um, schools and employers is tricky, you know, because you want to make sure you support your employees if they have this condition or any food allergy or disability, but also you want to protect the kids and your employees because you don't want them walking through the soccer fields or the, the woods to the soccer fields and getting bitten and then having this because then you have a real problem, right? But any tick, you know, is potential for disease, which is bad. So advocating, um, you know, anybody around me, so my kids know what to do. Uh, they're where all my um, emergency contacts have a smaller version of this and, and it, we've had the conversation what needs to happen. Um, in case they get that phone call. I've had that conversation with my own doctor. I'm like, I really need you up to speed in case I get in a car accident. And she did quickly um, when I had an incident, which is good. So um, that's TBC United. We, you know, we're going around, we're educating healthcare pro professionals. We just delivered training to the North Carolina Nurses Association. Um, hired by Blue Cross Blue Shield. They got their CME credits. Soon we'll be able to offer that ourselves. Uh, different organizations and town, town functions like this. And um, soon uh, the training will be available online where doctors and different healthcare professionals and organizations can dial in and take the online training and get CME credits from the comfort of their own home, which will be really nice.
because there really isn't anything. I mean, they pick up like at this level. They go into this really big conference on ticks or allergic reactions or you know entomology or something like that and infectious disease, and they're just catching sound bites of the stuff going on with ticks. They don't get the full gamut, like the ticks in your state and here are the conditions they give. So we're working on that. Um, and we have really great support and buy-in from the Federal Advisory Committee and other others they've been cheering us on, which is really nice. So that is really a day in the life of an alpha gal, like all the stuff that we do and what I've been doing. Um, and again, I'm just Beth from Chelmsford, you know, so whatever your condition is, if it's Lyme or another condition or a loved one, if you can get involved and step up, your voice does get heard, but you just have to be um, persistent as one of the Federal Advisory Committee's <laughs> members called me. Yeah? You know, boy, in the guidance, mm -hmm. what's the best way to get the out there Oh, great question. Yep. So um, first off, ticks can live, how many days do you think a tick can live in water? Anybody want to take a guess? Not you two. Nine. How many? Nine. 90. OK. And, um, how, how does everybody feel about that answer? Does it sound too high, too low? Underwater. Like in water. Like, you know, we, well, yep. Yeah. 90 days, yeah. So eight, they found them 80 days. It's disgusting. They, they really are good adapters to their environment. Um, so when you come in from the garden, so when I we used to garden or go hiking or something, I now have like one set of clothes that I wear. The, and light clothes, you wanna make sure you're wearing light clothes so you can see them. Don't put them in the washer machine and definitely don't lay them in your house anywhere. Take them off your body, throw them right in the dryer. Do not wait. Put them right in the dryer, 20 minutes, a lot of uh, things say 10 minutes, but 20 minutes now is what they're really recommending. High heat, cook them, they're dead, you're good. Because some of the ticks are really, really tiny. They're the size of a poppy seed. You can't even see them. And uh, like I said, some bite at all of those stages, like the Lone Star tick. Why don't you do a different uh, Yeah, I suppose you could, right? Yeah, I know. I don't know. I mean, you zippers and things like that. I don't know. I don't know. I just know the dryer works, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because they can get hooked into the, the little holes in your washer or something and then come back out, so you don't want that. Um, the other thing, a lot of the um, advice out there talks about getting rid of the leaf litter in your yard, get rid of the bark mulch because it's moist and damp, and treating the yard with like rocks, doing like a rock barrier, and that is good and that does work. Uh, and you know, getting rid of the, like when you're going on a hike, right? You go on a hike, just stay on the path, don't brush up against the edges and things like that. It's all good, it's all sound advice for all of the ticks except one, that Lone Star tick. It's the tick's quest. So they hang out on the edge of the grass, right? And they're just sort of, they put their front legs out and they're just sort of feeling like this, waiting for something to come by and they hitch a ride. Lone Star ticks can smell your CO2 100 feet away. And when they were doing the test, um, they put a student in and they could, you know, students started talking or whatever, and they could smell that it charged at them. So it hunts, it runs, it's the only tick that has eyeballs. Um, and it swarms too, they found, which is a different behavior than the other ticks. So like a, you know, angry bunch of ants or something like that, they can swarm as well. Then I see advertisements for all these companies now that say tick and mosquito. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know if they're effective in one jet? Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, you know, it depends on the product. I don't know all the product lines. Um, but if you go on the CDC website, they have a list of all the different um, active ingredients that are recommended. DEET and Promethean is always up there and being like one of the higher ones. Um, Permithian, they have found that that can, like Permithian treated clothing, like hikers, they wear that a lot, um, the socks and the leggings and things like that. Uh, but they have found that's coming out in some of the sweat. So, you know, the safety, I, I don't know. They say it's safe, everything's safe, but um, <laughs> living the life of an alpha gal, you get very pure in what you put on your body. 
But on that list, there is an ingredient called endecanone, and it's all natural. It comes, actually, it's like part of the tomato plant. Um, and that is, that's been found just as effective, if not more effective than DEET. And uh, my business partner, co-founder, uh, Jennifer, she, when she was going through her doctorate, she got sick with her lichiosis, babesia, and Lyme. And she was inspired to start a company called Tick Warriors and found a bunch of products. So they're alpha-gal safe, which is good, uh, because as he found out, like getting in the garden and stuff, even the manure sometimes. So the treatments we put in our yard can set us off if you have alpha-gal. So I like it because it's alpha-gal safe, but I like it also because it's all natural. So it's safe on the bees. It doesn't harm the bees or anything like that. The other thing they found is some of those, um, the tox, more toxic chemical ingredients, um, the ticks are building up a resistant to it. And uh, I mean, a lot of science is being done on that, arguing that, so it's a little controversial, but this stuff is like a soap and it, um, it just kills them instantly. It's just a particular product, which by the way, I have a prize for you. I was hoping somebody would ask a question like that. So I have a couple more of those in the back too. Um, they're just a little spray bottle of that soap. So you can, if you've got a tick on you, you just spray it on, it's gone. And then you can remove it, um, but you lather it up. It's a soap. So you could use it on an animal. You can use it on yourself. It's safe. If you've been out and you feel like maybe you might have something on, you know, like sometimes if you go, I tell these guys all the time, carry a roll of tape or a lint roller with you because if you get in a nest of those little nymphs, the tiny little things, they look like speckles of dirt on your leg. Um, they're really hard to get off, especially men with hairy legs. So you want to use a lint roller like that and it picks them up really good. And if nothing else, carry some tape with you. Um, but that you could spray on and, and wash your body. It's like a soap. It'll, it'll take it off. Yeah. Yep. So have they looked into treatments for, you know, pre preventing the uh, reactions? So I have what they call this acute urticaria, which is basically we don't know what you have. That's what I had too. <laughs> I know what that's like. <laughs> so I've had that for, since 2015, and it really was driven from a um, kind of a reaction that I had from just taking a, a medication, huh. and it triggered something. It's mm -hmm. all it did is it triggered something in my body. Yeah. And uh, so I went for treatments, and I was put on steroids for I don't know close to a year. I was taking prednisone for a year. Yeah. Really. Oh. And, that's intense. Uh, and I went to. Brigham and Women's, and within 15 minutes, they just said, we're going to put you on this uh, anti, this, uh, anti inflammatory medicine. It's, it's called actually, it's an allergy medicine. It's called uh, Zolaire. So you oh, get these, yeah. these injections, monthly injections, and depending on, you know, if I love the yard, no matter what it is, something triggers it, and, you know, all the symptoms you're talking about. I've ended up with four or five rolls, ruling oh. like, can't break. But the long story short is, is, of course, I have the, the non-diagnosis. Yeah, you don't know what the trigger is. Well, Zolaire is something that does tend to keep it at bay okay. until whatever. Um, yeah. Like you were saying, like, you know, if you eat something, you brush up against something, a Band-Aid, um, all things that I find that are, can set me off in one direction or another. It's, it's really just based on, like you said, you just don't know. So you might <laughs> want to ask your doctor to get tested for alpha-gal. So has, Just has, to has, say. has they ever have they ever like said you know Zolaire is a great treatment or even looked at it as a treatment? Yeah, uh, Dr. Cummins is doing a lot of research down in U University in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and they've been using Zolaire, but it does have a mammal component in it. So some people have been doing okay with it, and it's really changed their life, given them back their quality of life. I mean, there's some people who. You know, they're getting into arguments with their neighbors grilling because the grill, that airborne coming in their windows is setting them off. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have two grills in our house. I can't cook on the same grill as everybody else. But um, yeah, it definitely is one of those. It's kind of like that steroidal treatment. You know, some people just have to be on stuff all the time. Any other questions? Yeah? Well, one of the things that came up in the conversations, which was really great, exciting to me um, as a health coach, I, you know, I learned a lot about different dietary theories, right? So, you know, some diets work for some people and some don't, right? It's just we're, we're out of balance in different ways, and we enter into the condition or accident at those different junctures. And um, 
they have uh, found more successful treatment treating the whole body and the individual versus just slapping one pro result. So the same thing, right? So they, they know that they can give somebody this medication, you know, that tax, uh, tax the um, virus or something, no, just in general, right? And, but then they realize, you know, they're still stressed out. They're still not getting enough sleep. They're still not getting enough water. They're not eating right. They're eating all packaged junk food. You know, you gotta fuel your body with the right fuel. So there's a big uh, push to treat the whole body like mind, body, spirit, you know, getting people more less stressed and getting sleep and water and better nutrition and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they're definitely looking at all different, um, you know, everybody's input. So I would suggest write Dr. Cummins at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and I can write that down for you after. Well, it's funny because it's oriented. Right, right. It's not food as much. Yeah. There's been a lot of snake oil sold over the years, you know. So of course they're skeptical. I mean, we have, we have something going on right now in our support group that um, sparked the interest of a lot of people, and there are a lot of very false statements said that frankly could kill someone and it's 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 concerning so um, so with that I'm we can talk after I have another uh, yes thanks yeah Go ahead. Uh, I'm a dog owner and I walk my dog with a number of other people mm. who have dogs and dogs are great magnets for ticks oh yeah why can you give your dog a once a month treatment on a scruff of his neck and if the tick bites the dog the tick dies Mm -hmm. And yet, we don't have anything close to that to put on I people. Know. It I seems, know. seems like crazy. <laughs> I know. And why do the dogs get a Lyme disease test every year and not us? Why did I have to beg for three years as my hair was falling out? I couldn't stay awake past noon every day. I had headaches all the time. My joints hurt. I felt like I was going to break in half in my 40s and I said I am too young to feel this old something's not right and I got you were already treated and I said I had the bullseye which by the way the bullseye um, rash uh, that you hear about with Lyme disease that is common in 40 percent or less of the cases so that's not a telltale sign so be careful of that um, my son's had it twice First time, he was covered head to toe, literally, palms of feet, every nook and cranny, like somebody rubber stamped him with bullseyes. The second time, nothing. So you never really know. And um, the Lone Star Tick, when it bites you, it can also transmit uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And that c can look like um, Lyme as well it can give a rash so they call those aretha migrans or EMs and it's confusing so a doctor might test you for Lyme thinking oh you don't know the tick that you got bit by so you got bit by I know what this is it's the deer tick I'm going to test you for Lyme well you're not going to test positive because you got bit by another tick and you have another condition so um, just know that that you it, what's important um, if you've been bitten by a tick Another thing I want you to take away, if you've been bitten by a tick, save that tick, put it in a Ziploc bag, don't put it on tape, they hate pulling it off the tape, it's really hard. <laughs> you don't need to put alcohol in there on a cotton ball, you don't need to wet it, you don't need to do anything. They survive. In fact, the bacteria and viruses that are in those ticks will survive years. They found uh, Borrelia in mummies, so you don't need to do any of that. Just put it in a Ziploc bag, uh, make sure it's tight, 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 so it can't get out, and just set, put a date in there and location where you're bitten, and just sort of put it aside and table that. I would strongly recommend go, calling your doctor regardless. Anytime you get a tick bite, if that thing's been feeding on you, go to the doctor and report it. Bring the tick, don't let them take your tick, unless they guarantee you they're sending it off for testing. Um, because later on, if you get that, if, if, you te if you, let's say you take a prophylactic like I was given, and then later on you're still having symptoms, you know, maybe the drug just didn't work well for you. If you're having symptoms, then you can send that tick off for testing 
at that point because there is a cost to it. Uh, different labs test for different things because they have grant monies looking for certain, you know, investigating. There are some labs that test for everything. Um, Technologies is a great company. There's um, UMass Extension has some information you can get. I think there's some information on the back. But that's really good. So then if you get the tick back, so let's just say you get bitten, you go to your doctor, they give you a prophylactic, and you decide, I want to go get that t tick tested. So you send the tick off for testing, and it comes back, and it has like five conditions. That does not mean you have the condition. Your body may have fended it off. It may not have regurgitated it into you. So don't worry about it, you know, just um, use it as a tool so that if you do get sick, you do have that information to give to your doctor to say, well, they did find Borrelia or Babesia or something else. Um, so that's important. Yep. This is one group that you mentioned a couple times. Is that the one that's falling or is there? No, there's uh, over 30 different um, alpha gal support groups out on Facebook. So some are really big and kind of cover everybody. They're all closed or private or secret um, because the stuff we share, like if he came home <laughs> complaining, we can't have Easter ham and I'm really in a bad mood and I want to vent, I'm going to vent in my private group to people who get it. You know, or if I'm dating um, again and I'm having a great conversation and I decide we're going to finally meet up you know, because I'm doing this online dating thing, and the gentleman says, ugh, when I say, could you just not wear any cologne or perfumes or hair care, and uh, can you brush and floss your teeth? I've had a couple go like, what? You know, and I sound nuts, I get it, you know, and then, it, then to their point, they're like, that's a little bit much, so they, it didn't work out, but I am dating a guy who's pretty good, he gets it, and he actually eats like I do, just by choice, so it's good, um, but yeah. You mentioned there's one, one laboratory that tests for alpha. Yeah. How much does it cost for testing? Well, it depends on your insurance. Did your insurance pay for it? Yep. Yep. My insurance paid for it. Yep. Yep. I think, I think if you, some people don't have insurance in the company. I want to say, I think it was like $50. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't much. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. I know you. I see you studiously I writing. <laughs> I love your um, your binder. I love that idea. In case you have bigger maps that you can't speak, when you throw close stuff, I suspect the same thing uh, for myself. Uh, so, uh, so it's, in an emergency room, no, when they see alpha gal. Oh. I, no, I don't think so. I was asked that. Um, I was kind of scolded at the federal advisory committee. They were like, "And where's your medical br bracelet?" And I said to the doctor, "I said." So if I walked in your office and you know nothing about AlphaGal and you saw that, what would you think? It was just a trendy like chick thing, right? You know, I'm like having a feminist movement here. And he goes, yeah, true. And I said, okay. He goes, well, I go, oh yeah. What about if I put mammal, ma mammal meat allergy on that? What, how's that gonna help me? And he said, ooh, that's a good point, because he knew where I was going with that. He said, it would help you if you've had mammal in an exposure, they would know to treat you for an allergic reaction. They would identify and go like, oh, that's a, she has a mammal meat allergy, it's a reaction. But if they're putting the IV in me and it has gelatin, they don't know that. Yeah. You know? And they don't know about the adhesives, they don't know that the nurse has perfume on, you know, all these other incidentals, they don't know those things. So, I um, I hope that that's going to change soon, with some new ICD codes and uh, awareness. But I suggest to people, um, and I need to heed my own advice. That we found a company called Road ID that gives you like six lines of information that you can put on, and a phone number, and they will house that information. So I can give them a basic write up for the ER calling in to that number. So I like that one myself. And they have these cute little tags that can go on the side. So um, I can put like, you know, something that would direct them. I, I, my hope is to have one of those, uh, what are those things called? Those scanner things, Q, QR code or something like that where you scan it. I wanna get one of those, like we're looking at. No, it's like, you know, it's that square with the squiggly. Oh, yeah, I kind of, we're, we're looking at trying to put that together so you can put that on and they scan it and it comes up, but they don't like, you know, the ambulances and stuff, they don't like 
the USB things because that injects a virus into their computers and stuff. So don't go that route. You want something where you can really put it in. Yeah. Okay. What is it? Road ID, R O A D I D. Yep. All right. Well, did you, you feel like you can be safe with ticks and all? <laughs> all right. Very good. Thanks, everybody. So there's pamphlets, there's uh, samples, there's little wristbands. You're welcome to them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Good luck.